Education was not simply another part of American society. It was the key that opened the golden door. Education, you learn how to learn. We must trust, we must trust students to learn if given a chance. To learn if given a chance. Welcome to the 180 Days Podcast, where we're going to be talking about all things education, having to do with parents, students, teachers, policy, kind of whatever is happening in the news and what's relevant in the world today. This is our seventh episode. This is Karen Greenhouse, one of your hosts, and our other host, Tim Pope. Say hello. Hello. And we're very excited. This is our seventh episode, as I said, and we're talking about creating curriculum for success. And we are excited. This is our first venture into having a guest on our show. The other first. We have our first guest, and we have our first paid sponsor. This is sort of the truth and, the truth and advertising uh, disclaimer before we start. So I actually work for a publisher that does custom curriculum construct ed which is a division of kendall hunt that company is really built on this idea of helping districts like san francisco scale up to um, accomplish the tasks that they're setting out to do so with us today to talk about curriculum is elizabeth hull barnes or lizzie as we're going to be calling her she's the current math supervisor of the san francisco unified school district lizzie was an elementary teacher for years before becoming an elementary coach and so she's worked in professional development and supporting teachers with pedagogy for a long time when the common core shifts came up she was excited about this and she interviewed for her current position so now she works with a team of math teachers where they've created their own math curriculum so they've kind of broadened how people think about math and where and how you learn it using the standards and have kind of veered from the traditional path of textbooks and that type of thing to create a curriculum that really supports students in the 21st century. So welcome Lizzie. Thank you for being our guinea pig for this first um, guest appearance. So why don't you uh, give us a little bit of background on what you do? So Thank you for having me, first of all. Happy to be your first guinea pig. My name is Lizzie Hall Barnes, as you said. I am the mathematics supervisor in SFUSD. We are a large urban district, San Francisco, with 56,000 kids and 135 schools, pre-K-12. So what that means for us when we're thinking about comprehensive reform in our mathematics teaching and learning, we're thinking about everybody from three-year-olds to kids who are just leaving for college. Maybe we should start, though, with what do we mean by curriculum? Like, so where is curriculum typically coming from or the resources for curriculum? Okay, so in a traditional model, very often schools have adopted textbooks. And often, even if we don't say as a system that curriculum is what is inside of the textbook, teachers' experience is that curriculum is what the textbook is telling me to do and asking me to do with my students. And we have taken a different approach. Um, I would say a more expansive definition of curriculum would include the resources such as textbooks as well as um, attention to the standards and the learning outcomes for students and the pedagogies that support student success. Right, because what happened, I mean, I just know from my own personal experience all these years is a lot of teachers, you hear that phrase, teaching to the textbook, right? So we follow the textbook and we've got to get this content covered. And what you're saying is that the textbook's just one possible resource. You really should be looking at your standards and what resource is going to best support them. And of course, your students. If you're doing formative assessment or your students don't match the math task or whatever the the resource is, the way designed, um, you might adjust what's in front of you to better match the learning of your students. So even though we don't call our students our curriculum sort of formally, we, we as teachers want to be following the kids in front of us. Well, so you have that idea of teaching out of the book, like Karen, you just said, but then there's also, I mean, traditionally, it's a matter of you go through the process and you select the least of the evils. You have all the publishers come in and they all do their little song and dance. And I mean, districts and some districts spend a lot of time and a lot of resources. But at the end of the day, it's like, all right, well, which of these do we think will be best? Because none of these are perfect. I mean, I, I make curriculum for a living and it's there's no way I can make a curriculum that would work for the incredible size and diversity of San Francisco Unified that I could also then turn around and sell to Terre Haute, Indiana. Not that Terre Haute, Indiana is a customer of ours, but, you know, I I try to come up with random Midwestern town. But you get my point. Right. I think what you're saying, as we've seen, is a lot of textbooks make special additions for states to try to meet that state. So it may be the same book, but with certain things taken out or added in. 
So no book meets everyone's needs. Well, so that's been going on for a while, but that's all been totally content driven. I What I, I like about the San Francisco project and other districts that are taking on similar challenges is that you're also looking at a pedagogical element, an instructional element, an assessment element. Like, yes, it's easy enough to do the Texas or the California version of an algebra book, but all as a publisher we're doing there is saying, all right, well, how are the California standards different than some other state standards? And then making sure we throw in those lessons. We're not looking at a large urban district with a significant language learner population and a significant population of at-risk students and special education students. I'm like, all right, I'm going to sell there, but then I'm selling my same book at a, I was just down, actually, right the last time I was in San Francisco, I went down to a, a district who's piloting our books uh, down in the LA area, and they want our books for their gifted and talented, their honors classes, um, and they wanted to make sure the book was rigorous enough. So I can't do it. So this idea of, of districts owning that process and doing their own analysis, I say this every time I talk to a district, is that you know your students and you know what you need to do to accomplish your learning goals better than I ever will. So I'm all for districts taking ownership of that process. Right, right. And so I would even scale it smaller. So even SFUSD's math core curriculum we're asking teachers to follow our scope and sequence and adopt our signature pedagogies and individual teachers can and should have the license to adjust a task to better match the needs of their own students. So you're talking about, you know, selling to a district. Um, we're talking about teams of teachers at schools making commitments to each other. So it gets even smaller and smaller and smaller when there's that agency that teachers have. So Lizzie, maybe that's a nice segue into what is it SFUSD did? Like what have you done to build your math curriculum that's not traditional? So California adopted the Common Core state standards as did many other states, of course. And at the time, one of the contextual pieces of what was going on is that there actually weren't Common Core aligned textbooks. There were a lot of textbook companies that tried to do crosswalks and match former sets of standards to the Common Core state standards. But the danger in that is that you're missing some of the coherence that is described by the Common Core in terms of how content builds, as well as the math practices described in the Common Core. Right. I was going to say the math practices are probably really big. Huge, missing. huge. Yeah. Because the math practices yeah. are asking kids, for example, to defend their reasoning and critique the reasoning of others. And if you're looking at a textbook that is procedural in nature, there's nothing there to defend other than the steps that you used or the answer that you got. So the old textbooks that were written under the old standards, it's not like they were universally bad or anything. I'm not trying to imply that, but they weren't stepping into the rigorous context described by the Common Core. And so we adopted a scope and sequence aligned to the Common Core in our case, we use the Pearson Foundation Scope and Sequence. This is a K through Algebra 2 Scope and Sequence. And we then adopted a unit architecture. Many people have used a task-based unit architecture. In our case, we used one that uh, we developed and revised with the input of David Foster at SVMI. We also got input and advice from Phil Darrow, who we collaborate with through SERP and Harold Astorias at the Lawrence Hall of Science, and many others. I mean, we got, we got input from lots of experts in the field. And our unit architecture includes four rich tasks that appear throughout the unit that are doing slightly different things. But after we had that architecture, and we had our scope and sequence, we then asked teams of teachers, we had 120 R&D teachers at the outset, to look from amongst the best available tasks. That first year, we had an additional about 150 teachers who jumped in to pilot the units with us and give us feedback on our units before we had taken it out to our district system wide. And every year, we are gathering teams of teachers from the grade level to sit with us and give us feedback on all manner of things, like anything from pacing recommendations to are the pedagogies stitched throughout to, you know, are there enough opportunities to differentiate for all students and meet the needs of all learners. So every year it gets tighter and tighter. And for each grade and course, there's one lead developer who is housed in here and they take that feedback and work together on vertical alignment and sort of work to tighten all of the pieces within the curriculum. And that's a huge difference between us and any textbook, because a textbook, once it's published, it's flat. 
It's not going to change. It's not going to get better. It's not going to get tighter, except for the individual teacher's practice. Well, I mean, it sounds like you guys have living documents, basically, and you really, really are honoring teacher feedback, which you don't see too often in most districts. Usually it's, you know, the top few people make the curriculum and then it's just dispersed through everyone. You guys sound like you're really involving as many teachers and feedback and all that time as as you can, which is amazing. Yeah, that's definitely the intent. And, you know, alongside curriculum, the best curriculum in the world, we still want to support teachers to think about what these shifts in the standards and in pedagogy look like and sound like. So the curriculum in and of itself wouldn't change things for kids, nor will it ever. No curriculum has ever changed things in and of itself. So there's also another lever where we are um, supporting teams of teachers at schools through their own planning, supporting instructional coaching, supporting teams of teachers to come to us centrally to make sense of the mathematics and have experiences themselves as learners of mathematics. That feels really important because a lot of us grew up learning math as a procedural individual activity. So if you put a curriculum in front of teachers and say the kids are in groups doing this rich task, if I didn't learn like that, it's not obvious to me, nor should it be. I mean, that's not that's not any teacher's fault. That's not any practitioner's fault. But it's not obvious from the curriculum itself how to have the vision that every student can do math like this and how to make it happen. So Lizzie, how would you say, if I'm a parent or a student, how is my experience of math instruction different today than it was four years ago? Like from, from their perspective. So there are a couple of things I think of, and we do family nights all over the city very regularly. So these are the questions that I am often answering. So there's a couple of things like there are fewer tasks. The tasks are more open-ended, and there are multiple ways to show your thinking within any one of those tasks. So if I compare that to mathematics textbooks even four or five years ago, I might have had the same type of problem over and over and over again, and now I'm doing one experience that builds through the course of that test. So that's one big difference. Another huge difference is that kids are showing their thinking in multiple ways, which I just alluded to. So we're asking kids to write about their thinking. We're asking kids to use visual models to sort of prove or provide evidence around how they're thinking. That feels very different than sort of old school paper and pencil calculation. I would say those are the those are the biggest things in terms of the materials themselves. And then the pedagogy in the classroom, we're asking kids to sit in groups to do the things described in the math practices. So, you know, defend their reasoning and, and listen deeply and ask questions of the kids around them so that mathematics is an opportunity for sense making versus you know, who, who can get the right answer quickly. And then, so have you collected, I mean, whether formally or informally, any data on how these different stakeholders, teachers, students, and parents, how they've reacted to this new curriculum? We have lots and lots and lots of data. <laughs> we haven't necessarily looked at the reactions to the curriculum itself outside of the focal group structure. Um, but we do have the focal group structure, which tells us what teams of teachers are thinking about based on their experience in the field at all of the grades and courses. The data in terms of how things are going for us overall, another project in San Francisco is that we are holding to the commitment of heterogeneous grouping in our math classes versus sorting and accelerating. And alongside that, we do have instructional coaching and of course our curriculum. And we now see for the first time, this year's junior class is the first group of kids who came through middle school with our curriculum and our policy. And this year's senior class is the last class where virtually all of them took Algebra 1 in 8th grade with a more traditional textbook. And this year's senior class, 40% of them needed to repeat Algebra 1. This Mm. year's junior class, we're seeing only 8% are needing to repeat Algebra 1. I know, the the outcomes are amazing. Yeah, that's huge. And of course, there's a lot of things that change. The standards change, the assessment change, the curriculum change, the coaching structure change. So you aren't pointing to one thing in those kind of results, but we are seeing some evidence of progress, you know, through, for example, committing to a task-based curriculum. So now, just you just mentioned assessment. So I, I understand that the classroom's changing, the pedagogy, what we're teaching. So how are assessments different? Uh, you know, so how are teachers assessing students' learning since 
the way they're learning is different. So the unit structure itself, each unit has four tasks. A unit could be anything from eight to 10 days in some of the younger grades. And, and there are definitely some units that are a little bit longer. There are some units that are 20 to 25 days. But each unit has the same basic architecture, which includes four tasks. The first task, the entry task, is gives you a sense of what the kids already know about those mathematics in the unit, either referencing mathematics from prior grades or what they might have done in an earlier unit, um, as well as sort of ramping up and looking forward to what's coming in the unit. So that's purely diagnostic. What does the kid know? The second task is the apprentice task, which is helping us to sort of check in on what sense of the mathematics are the kids, you know, what, what, are, what are the kids now showing us? Um, the third task is the expert task. That one is the one that tends to have application in a novel context. So it moves away from the way kids might have experienced it in their lesson series and is sort of asking them to think beyond the context that they've already seen. And then the final one is called the milestone task. And that one checks in on the mathematics from across the unit. Um, that one's sort of the closest to what a lot of us would consider a, like a chapter test. So there are some aspects of it that feel like a rich task, and then there are, there are some discrete uh, questions or problems that might check in on some of the other standards within the unit. Now, because these four tasks are built into the architecture of the unit, there are four opportunities inside of every single unit for a teacher to check in on a student's progress within mathematics. Um, twice per year as a district, uh, we check in on those milestone tasks. Uh, for the Smarter Balance grades, it's actually once per year. So that is our centralized district assessment structure. But of course, teachers are doing these assessments and these tasks with kids, you know, all year. And then the other thing is formative assessment, of course, is a moment to moment understanding of where the kids are. What are their misconceptions? Maybe what is the next place that they can go? What's the next place that they can connect the different domains of mathematics? And we're helping them to to think in these ways, but you pay attention to what kids are doing in class, and then tomorrow the math talk that you might do to launch your lesson references whatever those misconceptions or next steps or ideas might have been from the day before. So there's an even tighter, smaller cycle of using formative assessment to impact instruction. That's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I know, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get my head around it. So, so I mean, it, it's it's like a huge undertaking, and and it's obviously it's taken you this is the sixth year since it started, right? Since the project started. So we're in the sixth year of the project, but in terms of developing and revising the curriculum, we're now in our fourth year of full implementation. So I guess it's just because it, it obviously it's so much easier to let's adopt a textbook and then we kind of have our everyone's doing following the textbook. This seems very involved like you had to have the teacher training and the students and the parents and everybody getting on board and you're constantly revising so what would you say are the biggest obstacles in creating this curriculum or not just the curriculum but the whole process i think our big idea is changing the culture of what it means to do math i mean so many people first disidentify with school because of their experiences in math. So many people self-describe as not being math people. I hear it when I do parent nights and I hear it when I talk to professionals who work in our district. So many people say things like, yeah, I was never really a math person or I was good at math until I was in eighth grade and I took algebra and then all of a sudden it didn't make sense anymore or whatever. So some of, some of this deep commitment and deep engagement, which has to include the coaching and the professional development, is shifting what it means to do math. If we think math is answer getting and speed, then a textbook would have been way easier. If we think mathematics is about um, collaboration and making meaning and providing uh, expansive opportunities for kids to show their thinking, um, then I actually think that this has been some of the best professional development that we could have done, is to gather teachers to help us write and iterate on our curriculum. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I think... I think the teacher input's amazing. So I guess another question is, have you had much pushback from teachers and parents and students? Because it is different from ev for everyone. Yeah, we definitely have people who ask hard questions. I think that would be true no matter, even if we had adopted a traditional textbook. So some of that is connected to the common core itself, right? What do you mean we aren't memorizing the 
you know, multiplication algorithm at third grade or whatever. So, so some of that isn't about SFUSD's curriculum, but about the overall shifts in the standards and the overall shifts in the standards for math practice. Some of the pushback that we heard at the very beginning was because our first, our first draft of our units were definitely more cobbled together. But as we've iterated, it's gotten tighter and tighter and more coherent. I think now the things that we're realizing that we need to continue to step into, one is how to iterate to provide access to dynamic software and rich technology experiences for kids, because we're preparing them for the 21st century, you know, for the jobs that don't exist yet. And another piece of feedback is how do we continue to support teachers who are teaching in incredibly diverse classrooms? Right. That would be true no matter what curriculum you put in front of teachers. But what does it mean to teach in a heterogeneous classroom and to, to put in front of teachers the idea that all kids can make sense of mathematics in a heterogeneous environment? All kids can enter in and you know build on their thinking and build on the thinking of others. So for us, that means supporting teachers to know and be able to do that with each other, with each other's support. This isn't about me. This is about teams of teachers at sites. And also, what are things like, we, we sometimes get asked about tier two interventions or extensions for, for students who are demonstrating a great love and deep understanding of mathematics. So how do we provide the full range of experiences that people can have in math? So I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you to share, you talked about cobbling units together and writing curriculum, um, but you did not... the. You didn't start with a blank screen and create math con- math from scratch. Correct. So can you explain a little bit about how you went about building um, building these units? So I was on the development team myself when I was a coach. So this was before I was in my current role. And the unit that I worked on with my little group of three was um, 5.2 in the fifth grade curriculum. And so what we were looking for, we knew what the standards were asking us. And so we were looking into, you know, at the time our adopted textbook had been everyday math. How does everyday math handle and think about things like um, comparing, you know, whole numbers and decimals? How does Engage New York? Engage New York was a new resource at the time. So we, we looked at a lot of what Engage New York had out there. We looked at a lot of what was in illustrative math. I myself always loved um, some of the activities from Marilyn Burns when I was in the classroom. So we were sort of looking around at what was out there and choosing mathematics tasks that best match the mathematical outcomes described by the standards in the scope and sequence. One thing that feels really important to say, just because I know we have an audience bigger than the three of us who are talking, is we have formal permissions relationships with uh, those publishers whose materials we are using. I don't want to imply that we went out and stole, you know, I took a task from here and a task from here and a task from here. I was going to say, I, if you hadn't said it, if you hadn't said it, I would have. <laughs> it just feels important to, to, to respect the professional integrity. Right. But there's also the OER um, resources as well, open education resources. Mm-hmm. So did, did you look there? Those are a little harder to uh, look through because there's just so much there and you're not sure it hasn't been vetted necessarily. Yeah. I haven't been on one of the design teams myself for about five years. So there's much more now that is available open source, um, I would say, than there was five years ago. Oh, sure. You know, but we were we were looking at illustrative math is a, is a good example. We're also a member district of SVMI, San Francisco is. So SVMI is the Silicon Valley Math Initiative. So a lot of people would know SVMI through the MAC exam or the MARS tasks. They also have a bank of problem of the month. So there are, I want to say, 34 member districts. I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but they're a great resource and, you know, not only tasks, but also pedagogical supports for things like math talks. Well, I mean, I think this exemplifies the beauty of collaborative uh, working together with other teachers is all of you have resources you know are good. And then so you're pulling in all those different ideas and looking at a lot of resources, not just one. Uh, The thing I wanted to make sure, why I wanted uh, Lizzie to talk about that was one of the concerns as a curriculum developer I have when working with districts that are, take on projects like this, you frequently, in an attempt primarily to save money, hear about, well, the teachers are just going to write their own curriculum and we're just going to, we're going to do our own, our own content. 
Well, the reality is the vast majority of teacher education programs provide absolutely no training on curriculum writing. And just because you're a professional and qualified and quality teacher doesn't mean that you're a quality curriculum writer or have the appropriate training to do that. And it's not a task to be taken on lightly. And what I liked about the San Francisco project from the beginning was this idea of, of I mean, respecting that there is content out there that people have done thoughtfully um, and researched and reviewed and put out there and to aspire to build a program that got the best from that and then made it work for them. Mm -hmm. And the more and more that we revise, I think this is especially true of our elementary curriculum, it is less and less derivative. I mean, there are some math problems that have been in the math education community forever. You know, for example, I always use some of the Tangram activities from Marilyn Burns resources about teaching mathematics, but it's not as if she herself invented the tangram or whatever, although she did one of my favorite uh, uh, curriculum developers, I have to say. Um, uh, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. So, so as we have iterated based on feedback, there are more and more pages that are SFUSD teacher created versus derived from Marilyn Burns or, or, you know, formal permissions relationships. Like I said, that's, that's especially true at our elementary. And it's because we're, you know, we're six years in, we've gotten feedback from the field, we can read our own units vertically and horizontally and see, for example, how are we introducing visual models? How do they build over a student's experience over time? And we can do that internal work of sort of auditing the way that we've designed our units and make it better based on our own feedback. So I think at the beginning, you saw more and more instances of photocopies of um, PDFs and things that were very clearly, you know, attributed to other writers. And that's less and less true, like I said, especially for elementary. Secondary still has many more resources that are you know, from established publishers. Let me ask you this. Let's let's go into our pretend world. And I called you tomorrow and talked you into becoming the new director of mathematics for Dubuque Public Schools. And you would give up San Francisco for Dubuque, Iowa. I know. Dream. Dream of the Dream of this. Who wouldn't? Uh, <laughs> the real estate market would convince me that it might be a good choice. <laughs> Very true. We won't even go down there. Anyway, a medium to small sized school district. Uh, you talk about all the people and the teams that were involved in creating what you uh, what you have there in San Francisco. So, if you were to come to Dubuque, uh, is it possible for a smaller district with smaller capacity to do something like this? And if so, how would you how would you have them start? Well, we always feel like we barely have the capacity to do this, and. I, I have a team of 12 content specialists that work directly with me, and um, we're trying to, to cover all of the grades and courses and reach out to our 135 schools. So I know that we feel like we can barely, we're sort of like always at the outside edge of what we can handle. Um, so I, I mean, that's a really hard question. I think if I were in a smaller district, I would be thinking about things like curriculum changes through doing things like formative assessment and then writing a math talk for tomorrow's lesson that best matches the needs of my students today. Or thinking about things like, how are we going to stitch in and agree to a bank of, I don't know, problem of the month problems that we can do together as a school or that we can do together as a district, rather than taking on a holistic writing and revision of a pre-K through Algebra 2 curriculum. But now would it make sense then to focus maybe at first on just one Focal groups grade level really or one looking subject at specific things area. we are trying so to build let's and just get try better to revise we have schools geometry that teach first, in both say, Spanish and, and see how that goes. Chinese. Sure. So we have and, bilingual you know, teachers full giving disclosure, us feedback to our one translations. Of the things that we had middle San Francisco is very interested in doing and is feedback actually to getting to a point where we might put our materials out for other districts to use. Now, a lot of what we have is very contextual to our city and to the state of California, but we're not there yet. So there's no promise implied by this podcast, but it's a question we're asking ourselves because other districts would be able to benefit from the hundreds of teachers that have been part of the development and iteration. And most most districts can't design a project of that scale. 
Honestly. Right. And obviously this, you know, if we think about Tim's new business venture with Kendall Hunt, the creating customized curriculum, it's obviously something that other districts are actually thinking of doing. So you using yours as a model for them, I think, is a great idea. Well, and a couple options. Sorry, I led Lizzie down with a, a road with a question that uh, I, I knew what I wanted the answer to be. <laughs> Sorry. What what answer did you have in mind? Did I get the right answer, Tim? What was well, the answer we were looking for, Tim? <laughs> the correct answer to the question <laughs> is uh, it's I, I agree that to do it to the scale that San Francisco did, I, I mean, I've had the pleasure of working with some of those folks, both uh, on Lizzie's math team, as well as her colleagues on the science side who have, are taking on the same task as we speak. There are scales to how you can do it. Um, so, for example, there are districts that have decided to go down this road, Kern, down at Kern High School District, down Bakersfield, California. They started with a similar process that they wanted the local professional community to drive the curriculum and drive the pedagogical choices they made. But rather than stripping it all the way down like San Francisco did, they made the decision that we're going to adopt a primary textbook that'll be our textbook but it's not going to drive the instruction that we're going to create a curriculum guide with additional tasks and with a scope and sequence that works for us and for our students but they didn't take it all the way down to the girders they started like all right we're going to start with this primary curriculum and then work from that and there are a lot of districts that do that you're right that is that is a way to do it that's more scalable I, that makes sense to me or, or something as simple as just going with the tasks that. And I think, and I shouldn't say this all out because I don't know for sure how it turned out. Lizzie, you might actually know because it's your neighbors there in Oakland. They selected a curriculum almost in a traditional adoption process, but then they customized and came up with their own tasks. So they wanted to have task-based instruction. So they created tasks that are that are locally created, developed, and, uh, and tested to meet the needs of their students, and then used that as a piece of a larger curriculum purchase. I believe that's true, but I honestly don't know the the state of the project, but I'll see some of my colleagues from Oakland, so I'll ask them. I think that was the model at elementary, specifically. So, Tim, I have a question for you, because we are being sponsored by Kendall Hunt, so I guess the question is, why? Like, what is what is your company doing with San Francisco that is connected to this whole project? Well, on the math side, it's pretty simple. They use uh, part of that, she talked about at the high school level, that a lot of the lessons, the units are based off of published material. And one of their core, their geometry course uses a chunk of our geometry programs. They came to us and said, we want to do this. And uh, I'll be a little nitty gritty just for people who are considering doing this, how it works on the back end. Um, they came to us and said, we want to use this as part of our program. And we want to be able to make copies of it and edit it. And how much will you charge us per student per year? And we negotiated a rate. And that's all there is to it. Like we gave them the PDFs of the book and I do nothing, nothing more other than cheer from the side um, and have nice dinners with them whenever I come to San Francisco. <laughs> but uh, so uh, on the science side, we're a lot more involved in that. We're actually helping them build their books and doing the composition work. They're giving us content and we're composing it and making it look like a textbook, which leads to, and Lizzie, you've, you've mentioned this in terms of iterations, but I, I want to talk about the one of the practical side effects of doing a, an iterative process is that those kids are getting new books every year. San Francisco prints new consumable books for every student every year so that they're not tied into one, one core book that they're uh, using and having to try to, to muck with every year for seven to 10 years or however long adoptions wait. And the nice thing is, Nowadays, with digital printing, you don't have to be as big as San Francisco to pull that off. I tell people, as long as you have 100 kids taking a course, you can do six iterations of a book and pay as much as you would pay for a hardcover book off the shelf that you're going to use. So part of the, the power and the, the ultimate big reason that I wanted Lizzie to come on and to spend some time talking about the San Francisco project is... Even as someone who works in publishing, I feel that for years, publishing has been a, a product and teachers have been sort of been forced to do whatever the publishers tell them to do. And the reality is that's not true anymore. And you, you being teachers, educators, parents, you can drive 
what materials and how, and what instruction your kids receive and you're no longer forced to accept what someone tells you well this is what the this is what the publishers provided us it's just not the way it works anymore and you don't have to be as big as san francisco to do that i mean in terms of the affordability of it now in terms of the time to build it and that's what we've been talking about and lizzie was sharing that she's got a significantly sized team and they're all working their tails off to try to make this work but you can scale it down and have a better product and a product that can change because the reality is we live in a political environment that depend who, depending on who gets elected next year, the standards may change, the assessments may change, your target may move. San Francisco is no longer stuck to that. If California were to decide we're not going to do the Common Core anymore and we're going to do this new set of standards with this new assessment, I mean, Lizzie has built a, and her team have built a program that would allow them to pivot and make those changes quickly. It feels slower to us, but that's the, the, I appreciate that perspective. So not to not to give Lizzie any nightmares. She's going to go home tonight and like, what would happen if they changed the standards tomorrow? Right, I know. No, don't take the common core. So one uh, one layer that I'll add, um, Tim, to what you're saying is that we also. So yes, we do print student materials. We print them in Spanish, Chinese, and English. And we have provided manipulatives for classrooms. That's another component that we've sort of um, outfitted classrooms with things like base 10 blocks and linker cubes and, you know, all the, all of the things that a student would need or, or that a teacher would need to, to build their classroom community. And our teacher materials, more and more, we're guiding teachers to our online platforms. So our curriculum guides for teachers have, you know, hyperlinks built in that will connect you to different places in the curriculum or that will point you to places inside of our toolkit that remind you about pedagogies or will link you, for example, to a three-act task to launch a really interesting mathematics idea or will link you to an activity inside of Desmos or, or something. So more and more and more, we are working to help our teachers to move away from that dependence on the printed. We know a lot of teachers still love, and I always love to like put sticky notes and make notes all over my book. But in today's digital world, you can also do that digitally as well. So, I mean, I think this has been a phenomenal conversation. Lizzie, thank you so much for sharing the process. I, I really, at some point, I think I just said, wow, and then was bl was blank for a while. It amazes me. Yeah, it, it amazes me the obvious amount of... Uh, thought that you and you, your your team have put together um, to build the to build this program and to get the results you have but I, I do believe you it, it wasn't just you right or did you do it all by yourself because that would be even more impressive <laughs> no of course not the team in San Francisco is absolutely amazing so we have 12 content specialists. Uh, each content specialist is sort of the lead developer on one or in some cases two of our courses. We also work very closely with colleagues in our early childhood department who have a similar process. Um, and those uh, content leaders and content specialists are pulling, you know, at the beginning it was hundreds of teachers to pilot and offer feedback across the whole project. And now they're pulling smaller groups of uh, focal groups to give us feedback. So. Our project represents hundreds of teachers and the, the 12 content specialists that sits here in curriculum and instruction. Um, we also have a, a special opportunity in San Francisco where we have nine instructional coaches out at our middle schools. So those instructional coaches are also giving us direct feedback based on the experiences that they're seeing in classrooms with the teachers they work with. So it's 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 definitely a team commitment and a team effort. It is amazing to me. I, I know several of the folks on your team because I used to work with them at Key Curriculum, and it's mm. just listening to what they've been doing is it's it's amazing to me what you guys have done. I think you definitely should share it with others. Oh, thank you. And, and with that said, I think we're like at a six mile. So I, I gauge the time of our podcast by how many miles I run. <laughs> before the end of it and and, and we're, we're approaching six mile we're at a six mile podcast that's a pretty long podcast but it's been great i really I, this has been a really interesting conversation and lizzie thank you so much for for being our guinea pig and being our first guest on our podcast i'm excited about that and just thanks everyone for listening and i'm going to definitely post the links to the sfusd 
site so that everyone can go explore what you have done. Um, cool. And thank you again. Thanks, Tim. And thank you to our sponsor, Construct Ed, which is a division of Kendall Hunt. So Kendall Hunt is the big publisher. We do regular books. And then honestly, because of... Uh, uh, not just because of, but because of San Francisco and a few other folks that have come to us just uh, on the side saying, this is what we're trying to do. Can you help us? Uh, we've taken that on and started a whole new division dedicated to doing projects like this, um, which, to be honest, fits in. I mean, Kendall Hunt's been doing custom publishing for 50 plus years now. So this sort of fits naturally into our story. And I love it because now when I go to conferences and teachers come up instead of like, uh, they just say, can you do this? Can you do this? And the answer is always yes. Can I tell you, it's the easiest job ever. All right. Well, thanks for a great episode. And as always, make sure you find us on iTunes and not only listen, but give us a rating uh, and subscribe to our station. We would love it. We'll also put a link up if you're interested in knowing more about how you can scale that and do the operational side of how do you get you have this great curriculum this thing you've built how do you get that out to all your students in a way that doesn't mean some teacher is spending hours at a copy machine or some web designer you're paying lots of money to to design a, a web page or interface for your custom curriculum there you go there's my commercial and we will see you or hear you next time thanks construct ed is a different kind of k-12 publisher don't settle for off-the-shelf curriculum that you can use for eight to ten years while standards change and force you to adapt to what you have with supplemental material build the curriculum you need and update yearly if you like construct ed will make you look at print and digital curriculum differently create one-of-a-kind content customize from existing curriculum or adopt existing education materials. Visit createcustomizeadopt.com today and start creating materials specific to your school, teachers, and students' needs.